Greetings and welcome to Words That Matter, a modern day book club. And I'm your host, Lee Smith. Uh, today we have an incredible guest. Um, you probably hear all sorts of times, oh, the, the conservatives don't know anything about culture. They're not interested in culture. They can't tell stories. They can't write books. They can't make movies. They can't do this. They can't do that. All they care about is crunching numbers and stuff like that. Well, that's not true at all. Um, our guest today is a man who I think in many ways is really, um, he is really one of the drivers of culture from the right. He is the publisher of Encounter Books. He is the publisher of The New Criterion. Uh, and the reason I really wanted to speak to him today, I was reading an article of his from nearly a quarter of a century ago. Um, and it, 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 in, in the magazine that he edits, The New Criterion. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But first of all, I want to introduce the man, Roger Kimball. Roger, thank you for being here with us today on Words That Matter. Oh, Lee, it's great to be with you. Yeah, so we'll, we're going to get to the Julian Benda essay in a second. That That's very important. Okay. So again, that's the reason. So, you know, we have to talk to Ro Roger. But, um, you know, we've had a number of your writers on, on the show here on Words That Matter, a number of your great encounter mm -hmm. authors. We've had uh, Paul Ray. We've had uh, Paul Tice. Yeah. Um, we had, mm -hmm. uh, we had, we had, uh, Mark Ram, uh, Ramsey was talking about the, 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 the oh, yes. comfort women. Right. Hoax. So, so you yeah. guys are, you are really on a terrific hot street. Congratulations. Thank you for, thank you for that, Lee. Thank you for your support. As I was saying to you before you started, it's all part of my plot to take over the world. World conquest. That's our that's our motto. Yeah, well, you're 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 I mean, you're getting there. Starting and, small. We're yeah, starting small. Well, no, you're getting there. Um, <laughs> so look, I, I mean I mean um your book your your book list, your publishing list does appear to be getting um a lot you've published great great books through the years. But this list and of late it appears to be getting a lot more attention. Is 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 it that people are looking for guidance on the right? Are people saying like, look, I, I don't understand the way the world looks. And thankfully, these guys over right. here at Encounter are, are, are laying it out step by step. Well, you know, I think, I think, Lee, that there is a great hunger for, I won't say guidance exactly, but let's say insight, a great hunger for, again, relevance is not quite the right word, but a great hunger for the significant. And uh, let's face it, our culture is devoted to the ephemeral. It is uh, devoted to promoting a kind of amnesia about where we came from, who we are, and uh, in very large part, both Encounter and the New Criterion uh, is devoted, they are devoted to battling what I call cultural amnesia. Uh, in, in my view, Socrates, I think you have a picture of Socrates in your opening credits, at least it's some noble Greek, I think it was Socrates, <laughs> uh, is, is just, as relevant, just as relevant to us today as he was, uh, you know, 2,000 two plus years ago. And um, I feel that way about the entire range of our cultural patrimony. Now, we live in a time now when even to talk about cultural patrimony will get you in trouble because the feminists won't like it because you're using the word patrimony. And they say, well, what about the sorority and so on? You know, and, but that <laughs> is exactly the kind of narrow-minded, bigoted, uh, superficial response to the um, great cultural deposit that we have been entrusted with. Uh, that's part of our problem today. And uh, as I say, both the New Criterion and Encounter Books um, are devoted to battling that uh, prescriptive, bigoted form of superficial anarchy. Roger, this is a terrific introduction. I, I would not have been able to do it myself. Uh, certainly, not, certainly, <laughs> certainly not like you. But it's a, it's a terrific introduction to the the essay and the book. I want to discuss with you. As I said, I was going through a back issue of the New Criterion, and I came upon an article right. from December. I have it in front of me, December nineteen ninety two. 
The title is The Treason of the Intellectuals and the Undoing of Thought by Roger Kimball. Now, the right. main subject, right. the main subject here is Julian Benda, uh, translated as The Treason of the Intellectuals. I will let you say it in French. Right. Um, I wanted to start off, though, with because what you were saying is, is, is fits in so perfectly with what you quote at the very end of the article, which is the epigraph mm. of the book. And I will say this in English. The world suffers from lack of faith in a transcendent truth. What did you see yes. in 1992? Because, uh, uh, again, I, I read this and I'm like, wow, this is, you know, OK, things... <laughs> Things were trending in this direction in 1992, but now yes. it's really different. What did you see in 1992? Then I'm going to ask you, what did Julian Benda see in 1928 when he published The Treason mm -hmm. of the Intellectuals? Yes. Well, you know, the, the French word is cleric, right? I mean, try his own de cleric. And that means, it does, intellectuals is a good translation. It means not just professors, but people like you and me and people who write for the, the New York Times, people who write for genuine newspapers, as well as the people who write for the New York Times, pundits, media stars, those are all clear. And um, the, the fundamental treason that uh, Julian Bonda saw was that they had um, given up on their vocation to tell the truth. And that's that um, that line that you quote from the from the end of the essay uh, is implicated in that because in order to tell the truth, you have to have at the back of your mind or in front of your in front of in the front of your mind uh, the, the conviction that uh, truth is something that requires the acknowledgement of something that transcends us here and now with our petty concerns. And the treason that, that, uh, that Julian Bonda saw then was a, a giving up on that vocation and the politicizing of intellectual life, the insinuation of political passions right in the center of the intellectual vocation. Now, everybody has their own has has his own political opinions about x y or z but what had happened he saw was that people had now corrupted the task of intellectual life by subordinating it to political passion so he speaks uh, somewhere of the intellectual organization of political hatreds now when i wrote that essay uh, i was struck not only by the uh, relevance of what Julian Bond had said way back there in the late 20s, because after all, those uh, uh, intellectual, the, the, the intellectual organization of political hatreds was gaining steam then. And of course, it rolled over all of Europe within a matter of years, where uh, the, you know, the Nazis systematically subordinated intellectual life to the demands of political purity. Uh, you know, uh, in their own terms. And um, I was struck by the fact that back there in the 90s, something similar was happening in our culture under the banner of multiculturalism. Of course, what was odd about the ideology of multiculturalism is that it was actually, there's nothing multi about it. It was always a monocultural animus directed against the, dom the then dominant culture of the West. So that was back in the time of Jesse Jackson, Jackson and hey, hey, ho, ho, Western cultures got to go. Right. He led students across the campus of Stanford. That was the time when you had, um, uh, you know, they used to be called Afro-American studies uh, when they would uh, tout the, the great achievements of the African way of knowledge and tell you about uh, uh, the ancient Egyptians who were said to be black, uh, th their contributions to things like um, uh, nuclear physics and so on. I mean, it was quite I insane. But still, that was a, it was, a, you know, it was an academic um, fad, an academic trend. Well, what has happened since then, of course, when we, we bring it up to our own time, is that 
those elements that were on the fringe in the 80s and 90s, multiculturalism and so on, they have totally taken over. I mean, you can't, uh, the, the, the ideology, for example, of um, uh, ever more exotic forms of sexual perversity, the transsexuals, the, I mean, it's just, it's a round the clock obsession with things that differentiate us and uh, rather than unite us. The, the ideology of so-called climate change. And so it's, it's, we, we, we are really at the mercy of um, uh, political hatreds now that seem to become more and more virulent, more and more surrealistic in their um, ex- extremeness. And um, it's, you know, it's obviously different in many ways, but there's no guiding uh, uh, concept like anti-Semitism, unless, of course, it might be the anti-white ideology um, of some of our uh, some some of our critical race theorists. Um, but it's 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 quite amazing to watch this. If you go back to the to the 80s and 90s when m- many of these movements were still in a sort of nascent, incomplete form, and to watch the way they have just steamrolled over our culture now. You can't, you can't read a major newspaper or magazine or uh, look at a, um, a, you know, an important television channel without being inundated by this stuff. And so uh, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this, uh, that 1992 essay to me, I'll have to go back and and perhaps repurpose it because uh, the the the, uh, the the idea that um, I mean, the core idea for in the treason of the intellectuals is that uh, intellectuals had given up on their commitment to the idea that we are all in this together that we, we share a common humanity you know you you might come from uh, Europe or Asia or Africa or Detroit or wherever, and you might have this particular ethnic background. And th- those are, are real differentiating things, males and females and so on. But you know, white, black, still we share a humanity in common that transcends that. And once you give up on that, you have uh, started down the road to a very divisive uh, ideology. It's turned into sectarian chaos. You should definitely repurpose yes. this. You should definitely repurpose this essay, if, if that, to, 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 to borrow your phrase. Um, and I, I, what I want to ask you after the break, because we're going to cut away for, for mm. less than a minute, what I want to ask you when, okay. we, when we're coming back from the break is, what is, your, what is your posture now toward that piece and that sentiment you had in the 90s? Are you surprised by how bad it's gotten? Or did you have a sense back then? And are you now, ah, if only we'd been paying more attention. I, I, we all actually right. saw this coming. So we're going to pick that up after our quick break here. If okay. you're watching on YouTube. Please make the jump to Epoch TV. We're going to be continuing on Epoch TV exclusively, having a fantastic conversation with uh, with writer, editor, publisher, um, intellectual, the great Roger Kimball. So make the jump with us in less than a minute. We will see you again shortly. You've got to understand that terrorism is an information operation. It's not a kinetic operation. Okay, you're not going to destroy an army. You're not going to wipe out American combat power. What you're doing is targeting American morale. Uh, That's kind of what happened in Israel. What they did is they went house to house butchering people in the most horrible ways, including rape. But they didn't hide it. They publicized it. They filmed it. They uploaded it because they wanted people to see. The second day of the attack, I hear a lot from people uh, that armed civilians don't have no effect, they don't matter. Oh, no, no, no. If I'm leading five killers murdering innocent people and one guy shows up with a handgun, suddenly I have to reorient my entire squad, not on my mission, but on eliminating that threat. And that gives normal people the chance to get away, to take cover, uh, police build up combat power. So the, the idea of armed American citizens uh, in a situation like this, a widespread 
uh, rape and murder. Um, it is a hugely valuable and, and vital tool.